When I first got into electronics and radio a long, long, long time ago, I knew very little about how radios actually worked, how AM modula modulation worked. Um, I kind of knew that radios came in two flavors, crystal and superheterodyne, and I knew that you wanted to let the latter of the two. Anyway, skip forward a few decades, and I would get much, obviously, much more into it, get my amateur radio license, um, and one day I... Uh, out of the attic I pulled out some toys including the one you see here and I noticed there was a radio receiver circuit and it didn't quite look like a TRF or a region um, certainly not like a super heterodyne so I didn't know exactly what it was and it turned out it was not one of those four kinds I just mentioned it was something different it was a reflex receiver uh, which I would learn uh, was first thought about uh, in the very early 1900s, in the 19-teens. So what we're going to do today is we're going to recreate um, a, a reflex AM receiver. We're going to do so while <laughs> AM broadcasting is still a thing. Uh, I'll show, we're going to build it, I'm going to show it to you in operation, and uh, then I'll go through the entire uh, schematic step-by-step uh, step to show you exactly how a reflex radio, AM radio works. So with that, uh, let's get going. Before we start, a little bit of background. Uh, where does this circuit comes from? come from? I mentioned it's uh, about 65 years old. So yeah, it's, this comes from the Norelco, and it was also sold under the Philips brand in Europe, uh, the Norelco EE20 um, electronic educational kit. Uh, this was perhaps uh, the OG of those all-in-one kits uh, that you um, can or maybe have been familiar with if you uh, if you were in the uh, doing this in the 1970s perhaps you remember the Radio Shack Science Fair you know like 50 or 101 uh, boards where you could put together various circuits based on instructions um, those were popular and uh, the sort of the current incantation of, of this sort of thing would be represented by the Alen Alenco snap circuits, which would be the closest uh, modern equivalent. Nevertheless, this kit uh, is 60 years old. Um, I actually owned one of these as a kid, and I actually built the circuit that you're going to see, although as a kid I really didn't understand anything about tuned radio frequency or, or region or anything. Uh, I'm not going to go into this kit in any great detail because I'll probably make a separate video, but if you're curious, uh, this is what it looks like inside. So it, had, it came with speakers, it came with um, all sorts of parts, and as you can see, three transistors, a diode, resistors, and so forth. Um, I actually own two of the these kits, one of which was my original one, which I dug out of the attic and was uh, was missing many parts. And in order to get some of the unobtainium parts, I had to go on eBay and find another kit which was partial. And between the two, I recreated the complete kit. Anyway, uh, enough of that. Let's get to uh, the, the actual radio circuit in here. So the EE20 kit actually featured uh, three AM radio receiver circuits, the one transistor radio, the two transistor radio, and the three transistor radio circuit. And it turns out uh, their front ends were absolutely identical, uh, and they really only differed in the, the one transistor circuit, which is shown here, and this picture is simply taken out of the manual. Uh, only had one transistor and it fed uh, a little earphone which you can see uh, in the middle of the picture. The two transistor uh, circuit added a um, uh, an audio amplifier which made the little uh, the little earphone a little louder. And finally the three transistor circuit which is what uh, I'll show you as built. Um, but this is how they would intend to have you build it. Again this is a still picture. Uh, note the the two four and a half volt flat batteries that are in the top right. Uh, these are actually surprisingly still made, but in all of the circuits in the kit, they're always wired in series. So all of the circuits in the E20 kit operate on nine volts. So as you'll see, there's no reason not to replace these with a simple with a simple nine volt battery. But I was surprised that these um, 
these particular batteries are still made. Uh, I remember as a kit they were popular for pocket so to power pocket-sized flashlights, uh, particularly in Europe. Anyway, so now uh, I'll actually show you what uh, the circuit, the three transistor circuit, as I built it. Here's the circuit's wiring diagram card on which you would assemble uh, the circuit before any of the components are on it. Uh, this would fit on the baseboard as you saw under all the components and spring clips would go in through the holes and then you'd basically start wiring it up with uh, insulated wire, bare wire, and components. Here's the completed EE23 transistor AM radio receiver uh, as I built it. Uh, since I did use some modern parts here, I thought I'd point out things which may not immediately be recognizable. Uh, first of all, we have our, um, our ferrite loop here. Uh, this is actually two coils. Uh, there is a uh, the red yellow coil, and then there is a green gray coil, and we'll see that in the we'll see that in the schematic. Uh, other things of note: this, this. And this are the three transistors, uh, the AF116 and two AC126s. Um, they look strange because I actually extended them. Uh, here they are with their little red um, pants, and uh, they're actually ma I actually mounted them on a piece of perf board and extended their leads uh, with with push pins out uh, because their leads were getting kind of tired, and I. And uh, this is how you would have normally connected them by simply taking the transistor and bending its leads, but after a few times of that, that doesn't do it any good. So uh, I extended it onto a perf board so to make it more robust for multiple uses. Um, uh, other things, this is uh, the, uh, the detector diode. Uh, as you can see, I have two diodes in parallel here. Uh, the reason I did this is not because I didn't have the OA79, which is a, a germanium diode with about a 1.2 volt uh, forward drop. Here's what the original OA79 looks like. Uh, it's a beautiful little glass diode, which is a pretty big glass diode actually. Uh, but for some reason I found that two of these diodes, and I'll put on uh, down there what they are, uh, these actually work better than just one diode, so go figure. Um, apart from that, this here is a 0.01 uh, disk capacitor, although it's rectangular. Here is uh, one of the original 47,000 picofarad capacitors, which came with the kit back in the 60s. I left it in there just uh, for reference. So these are the, what look like if you've ever serviced Philips European Philips gear from the 60s, you'd recognize the style of, of olive drab capacitor and it checks out and works fine. Apart from that, new electrical eggs, well, the usual stuff. Uh, the speaker is here. Obviously I didn't use two 4.5 volt batteries, I just put one 9 volt, works fine. Um, apart from that, uh, the only other thing of note is this coil. Um, this coil is the only coil um, in fact, it's the only component which is never which never has a value mentioned anywhere in the manual, in the parts list, on any of these cards, on the schematic. It's just a choke. Uh, we'll see it again in the schematic, uh, but its value um, is, un unless you check it, unknown. Here is the one coil that comes with the kit. Um, it's used in uh, several projects, not just uh, the radio ones. But as, uh, as I said, it's the only component in the entire kit which nowhere does it have its value called out. Um, it's a little, it's wax, it's covered in wax. Um, and there's no, there are no markings on it whatsoever. Uh, and you notice I don't, I don't excessively bend the leads back and forth. I'll just leave them the way they are. Uh, but let's, uh, let's actually try and see what, what this is. And the only thing I, I don't have a proper LCR meter, but I do have um, good old Chinesium component tester. So let's see what it says. Um, we'll pick, we'll pick red and blue. What the heck? 
and connect it up. And let's see what it says. Hmm. Okay. Uh, it is a 5.2 micro Henry coil with a resistance of about 26 ohms. So 5.2 micro Henrys. Very nice. At least now we know what we're what we've got. Uh, this is just uh, sort of one of those plastic tuning capacitors. Um, it's on the mounted on the underside of the board, and then this is the on-off switch volume control, of course. Um, this here is just a little DPDT slide switch, which is not used in this build, uh, but you could use it for on, usually use it for on-off or selecting things. But in this circuit, it, it is not wired anywhere. So. Without further ado, let's turn on our three transistor receiver. But So as you heard, uh, quite a few stations came in pretty loud and clear. Uh, the very last one you heard was a, a local PBS station, which transmits only about a mile away from me. Um, is this a, a DX fiend? No, not really. Although, if you pick up the whole board and rotate it um, so that the loop is pointing in the proper direction, you will pick up uh, things. So the, the loop here is, is very, very directional. And so if you are looking to pick up more distant stations, uh, rotating this uh, helps a lot. Wikipedia has a pretty good article on reflex receivers. Um, just search that and you'll find it immediately. This is the block diagram from that article. Um, and it pretty much matches what would be the block diagram for the circuit we're going to look at. Um, the only thing missing would be in purple uh, a two transistor audio amplifier stage which fits between the low pass filter and the little purple speaker. Uh, apart from that it's pretty much all there. The green thing is the first transistor which acts as the RF and audio amplifier and the bad pass filter really is a combination of the uh, ferrite loop and, and the tuning capacitor and, and that's pretty much it. So here's the schematic of the EE20's three transistor radio. Uh, this is obviously straight out of the uh, manual in the kit. Um, I checked the schematic. There's really nothing wrong with it, but there, are, there was one error I found. You'll notice R5 is called out in two different places, but it is accurate. Um, one of the nice things about the manual is that it does have a theory of operation for every, all of the different circuits that you could build, including this one. And uh, after reading it carefully, what I'm going to do is basically give you my interpretation of how this circuit works uh, step by step. So with that, we'll get started. But first, uh, let's add some component values to this. That's better. Um, so let's take our, let's take a look at this circuit. Uh, going, we're going to go from left to right, but I just want to go start at the far right uh, at the nine volt battery, which was originally made up of two four and a half volt uh, flat batteries back in the 60s. Now it's just a plain old nine volt. But interestingly, the plus here, the positive, is on the bottom and is what's being switched by the on-off switch and what in fact forms the ground of the entire uh, circuit. Um, 
the negative is what's fed up on top and feeds everything else uh, in, in the radio. And the reason the negative is, is on top is because all three of these transistors are PNP. So now let's start on the far left and we have our an, an optional external antenna on a dotted line here because it's optional. The manual would have you, if you wished, it was optional, throw a long wire out the window and then at the uh, ear end of it uh, loop it two or three times depending on which works for you best according to the manual around the ferrite rod and the other end goes to uh, to ground, uh, not just circuit ground, but which ought to be, say, a cold water pipe. Uh, that the, the external antenna in this, in this little uh, coil was entirely optional. I, of course, didn't do that. The next dotted line here represents the ferrite rod and connected to the fer around wound around the ferrite rod are two loops, L1 and L2, two coils. So. Starting at L1, the combination of L1 and C10 forms a tuned circuit, which when you adjust T C10 so that this is in resonance with some very nice station that you want to receive, uh, current starts flowing round and round because it's being induced uh, into L1, passed by C10. That current has no re really where else to go except back through the rod, uh, the ferrite rod, where it induces a current into L2. That current then uh, flows into the base of T1, which is our germanium PNP um, first stage RF application. RF application. RF amplification. Uh, T1 is biased by R1, presumably so it runs in uh, in the linear region of T1. Anyway, the the amplified modulated RF comes out of the collector at which point it has a choice of where to go. Uh, it cannot go to the right because it is blocked by what amounts to a low-pass filter formed of R2 and L4. Instead, it goes through C11 and through the detector diode, at which point we have, uh, we have audio, essentially demodulated audio, which comes back down here and back to the left through L2 effortlessly and then back into the base of T1, which now, which now amplifies that as well. Comes out of the collector again, at which point it is of low enough frequency that it passes through the low pass filter here, and at which point it goes through C13 and then into our volume control, which is P3. It's not R5, it's P3. Uh, some amount of that be is picked off and then of course goes into two almost identical amplification stages made up of T2 and T3 uh, which are biased by R R6 and R8 uh, respectively and then feed our speaker here. I didn't label it but reportedly this speaker has 150 ohm impedance so um, and that's what you hear. So that, in a nutshell, is um, the theory of operation of the Neuralco Phillips 3 transistor reflex AM receiver. So hopefully you've seen that the um, reflex AM receiver kind of starts out looking like a TRF set, you know, with just a, uh, a coil and a, and a variable cap and that gets immediately amplified, um, but it goes further than that. And it's not quite like a regenerative receiver because uh, this fir that first transistor doesn't get fed back, positively get fed back more RF, it gets fed back audio. So it does double duty, amplifying both RF and audio within the same transistor, or I guess in the 19-teens, the single tube. Um, and then that, I guess that's what makes it unique. And of course it has nothing to do with heterodyne, heterodyne receivers which have local oscillators and all that. That would presumably come later. Anyway, I hope you found this interesting.